The message this morning, a distinct stoop, comes from verse 6 of Psalm 113, where it says that God stoops, well, first it says in verse 5, that he sits enthroned way up high, so high, that then in verse 6 it says that to look on heaven and then through heaven to earth, he has to stoop. And that image touched me, obviously, because, you know, sometimes, well, I don't know where he- you, you picture kind of God's face or, or at what point God is looking at humanity and, you know, let's admit that it's often all about me, right? So when you're thinking about God looking at me, I kind of get his face starting wherever the clouds are that day, you know, I kind of, I move him down close. But this Bible verse shows what they always taught us in, in Hebrew at seminary. There are so much humor in the Bible from God's perspective. Because, you know, we get pretty impressed with ourselves all the time. And in Hebrew at least, and as you see in Psalm 113, It's hard to think that you're all that big if you make God as big as God is. That he is sitting up there, not where the clouds begin. Maybe not even where the universe ends. We have no idea how much space there is beyond that. And let's face it, we're, that's a pretty big galaxy. But all of that is contained like maybe in one hand of God. So this God, who is so big, and if you just dwelt on that long, you'd say he's far away. How can he care about the things of man? It's worth remembering he has a distinct stoop. He kind of we had a distinct stoop while we were in Costa Rica. It was from all the heavy lifting. But his distinct stoop, God's distinct stoop, is an intentional stoop. He is all the way out there. And then he chooses intentionally to look down on us. And I, I think, well, it humbles me. To think that in order to look at me, it's funny how things are reversed from God's perspective. It said there in the psalm, he sees heaven first and he has to look through heaven and, you know, the high altitude thing to see the earth. And I thought, oh, never thought about that. That God has to choose to look, bypass the clouds, bypass a whole bunch of stuff to look down low. And yet he does. And then it's not just look down low because if he just wanted to kind of see humanity or or the, the, the things that are visible, he's gonna see the best. He's gonna see the most powerful. He's gonna see people who are succeeding because they're the faces that are on billboards. They're the faces that are in front of microphones. Those are the faces that are so visible in our culture. But that's not who he sees when he chooses to stoop to kind of peek in his little, his little viewfinder. Oh, it says that he lifts the poor out of the dust. And that is a countercultural message. I want to say it's even countercultural in the church because we tend, I mean, I appreciate all the all the adoration I get, but I realize you guys keep me because of Glenda, who, by the way, is not well today, if you're wondering where she is. But even in church, it is often the, the noisiest, the flashiest to get all the attention, but that's not who God is looking at in Psalm 113. He's looking for the needy and the poor, and he lifts one out of the dust and the other out of the garbage heap. Anytime you see ash heap in the Old Testament, that's saying he picks them up out of the trash. And I thought, oh, I sometimes don't remember that about God. 
that he could choose to look away if he wanted to. He doesn't have to look at this mess. He could just look at the beauty of creation. It's amazing. And you think about from his perspective, I, I mean, I don't know how often you look at the pictures out of the, it's not the Hubble anymore. What do we call this new telescope that we all spend our money on? Anyhow, your tax dollars and my tax dollars at work. But there's some awesome pictures. And I think if I were God, I could spend all day scanning, or as we now scroll, you know, oh, I forget what it, whether it's left or right that you do when you're on a phone. No wonder I can't get back to messages. If you haven't got a message from me, I scrolled the wrong direction and lost it. But that's not who our God is. It's God who chooses to get a kink in his back while he's peeking through a little hole. And he's not looking for Brad Pitt or, you know, whoever your, your measure of success is or beauty. It says he's looking for the poor and for the needy. And those are the ones he's going to lift up. And I think if I were writing the Bible, I would have stopped there. I would have said it's just, it's enough to be rescued from God. But then he gives them something unexpected, at least as I read it. He removes the satin rope, or the velvet rope, depends on what the material is made of, that keeps you know those that are in the, the special kids from the uncool kids. But it says he takes these very people that, that the world despises and he gives them access and he sits them at the table. I want to tell you that this is a countercultural message. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about Costa Rica and things today. I will talk about it maybe more in two weeks' time. But if you've been to any third world country, you know that the distinction between the haves and the have-nots, well, I mean, it's kind of, oh, I, I couldn't resist the pun. It's pretty stark <laughs> in the United States. It's even greater as you leave the United States. You could definitely see who has the money, who has the power, and they have guards and gates to keep out the poor and the needy. And it said in Psalm 113 that God takes that gate and that guard and it doesn't matter anymore. He's the one that places the poor and the needy after he has stooped down to find them, as he has chosen to stoop down to find these folks, he's the one that gives them access to celebrity stuff, gets the country clubs, the gated communities. And I know that shouldn't come as any surprise to a Christian, that that is who God is. But to the church here, and, and, and obviously we are blessed. We have the inheritance of the generations of Uvalde that have provided us with this building. We might take this nice, comfortable sanctuary for granted if we didn't choose intentionally to say we might need to remember this aspect of God who gives us, who we worship here, is to remember this stoop that he has because we must say to ourselves, do I have that stoop? When is the last time I stooped past the people who were easy to talk to, past the people that were in my clique, who got to sit at the right, the correct side of Sonics with me, the cool kid side of Sonics, or whatever the demarcation line is. Because Philippians 2 said this to us, to you and to me, you must have the same mind that was in Christ, who even though he was in very nature God, he decided that that privilege, okay, I'm kind of loosening the translation a little bit so that we get what God is saying, he didn't take that privilege as something that he was just going to absolutely keep a death grip on, but it said instead he humbled himself. And we need to hear, if, if I was in a, 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 a different denomination, I would say, say after me, I humbled myself. But that's what he's saying, 
have you know, this instruction to the church in Philippi, this instruction to the church in Uvaldii, say, we must have the mind of Christ, who, being the very nature of God, did not hold on to it with a death grip. We have this inheritance of over a century and a half, but we can't hang on to that with a death grip. We have to take the form of a servant. He left, he had all the power of God, and he put that aside because he has this distinct stoop. In the Old Testament, it was from above. In the New Testament, it's boots on the ground. And it said he humbled himself and he took on a different nature, the nature of a servant, so that he couldn't expect frontline privileges. And of course, it struck me in, in Costa Rica because we had frontline privileges. Being American missionaries, we were always, you know, get out of the way. The American missionaries are coming in. And I thought, oh. But I couldn't deny that I looked like one. I was sharing how I got mocked in the grocery store because they knew by just looking at this boy, oh, that's an American. So they did, you know. And, and, and it's not that Americans don't mock other foreigners, so I didn't take it personally. I've traveled all over the world. I've been mocked in Iraq. I've been mocked in Afghanistan. I've been mocked in China. I think I get mocked in Uvalde sometimes with my new Australian hat that I wear. Yeah, I see people nodding. Okay. So, so I don't take it personally. <laughs> but that distinctive look gave me front of line privileges and I thought, oh, this is the absolute opposite of what I was hoping that we could do here. Well, the good thing is, y'all live in Uvalde, people know you. They're not gonna give you front of line privileges. <laughs> if you decide to stoop to those that are poor and needy in your circle, you're going to get to do it authentically. You're going to get to do, yeah, just right there. And I think it will surprise people, especially if it's someone that you've had bad blood with for 40 years now. And until you were challenged, you were okay with them being in the garbage pile somewhere. But... That word from Uvaldii or Philippi is to you to say, take on the nature of Christ who has a permanent stoop, a stoop that led him, as I said, he humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. If that is what our Savior chose to do as he put on his stoop, how can we say we can't stoop? How can we say we'll not do that? We've been praying for Uvalde. I've always maintained that the transformation of Uvalde begins when the churches of Uvalde are transformed. When they begin to truly reflect Christ, of course it challenges me, I have to say, oh, who have I walked by recently and not seen? Who has the Lord placed in my life that I must die to self, that I must become a servant of? And it's not just hugging Nancy Ham, but it's more than that. <laughs> it's that real stoop, that real reaching down and saying, okay, Lord, you have made me your angel today. So that's my challenge to you as we go into the world after this service to recognize that the God who is so, so high chose to come so, so low. And he says to his people, Follow me. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, let us be about your work. We thank you for your death in our place. We also ask you for the faith to follow you, wherever that is, to stoop wherever we need to stoop. Because we know someone is waiting to meet Jesus in us, in our lives today. You're still alive, and you live in us. It's in your mighty name we pray, Jesus. Amen.